Welcome to the second lecture for Existentialism, where we cover Simone de Beauvoir's Ethics of Ambiguity, specifically the second chapter from this 1949 work. Simone de Beauvoir is perhaps the most important feminist of the 20th century. She's covered most often in women's studies classes, and she's, she's really more well-known and respected in that discipline. This work that we're covering is not as well known as The Second Sex, which is her contribution to feminist philosophy. In The Second Sex, she argues that women remain in the position of the other, right? They're unable to achieve complete human freedom because of this. And she called for a positive social and intellectual and political change. In The Ethics of Ambiguity, she expounds a defense of an existentialist ethics, one that echoes Sartre's from existentialism as a humanism. But it seems, at least to me, a bit more assertive, better articulated, and in the end, much stronger philosophically. It might be said that de Beauvoir discerned the necessity to expand on and explain what Sartre had said in his 1947 lecture. Both Sartre and de Beauvoir were lifelong friends and lovers, though they always had an open relationship. They were very controversial for the time. These types of behavior made both Sartre and de Beauvoir infamous, but also famous uh, figures of the mid-20th century. Both her and Sartre uh, spend much of their lives politically active and philosophically trying to reconcile existentialism with Marxism. She eventually abandoned socialism in her later years. But we see a bit of this reconciliation start to take place in this work that we're, we're covering in this class, The Ethics of Ambiguity. And we skip the first chapter of this work. Much of it is just a repetition of some of the things that Sartre says in his lecture, Existentialism is a Humanism. So we skip the first chapter and begin at the very beginning of the second chapter, with a section called Personal Freedom and Others. Let's go ahead and read the, the first part. De Beauvoir writes, Man's unhappiness, says Descartes, is due to his having first been born a child. And indeed, the unfortunate choices which most men make can only be explained by the fact that they have taken place on the basis of childhood. The child's situation is characterized by his finding himself cast into a universe which he has not helped to establish, which has been fashioned without him, and which appears to him as an absolute to which he can only submit. So what point does she make about the child or childhood? What is she saying here? She says later that there are some who remain in this childlike state. On page 37, there are beings whose life slips by in an infantile world because... Having been kept in a state of servitude and ignorance, they have no means of breaking the ceiling which is stretched over their heads. Like the child, they can exercise their freedom, but only within this universe which has been set up before them, without them. This is the case, for example, of slaves who have not raised themselves to the consciousness of their slavery. The southern planters were not altogether in the wrong in considering the Negroes who docilely submitted to their paternalism as grown-up children. To the extent that they respected the world of the whites, the situation of the black slaves was exactly an infantile situation. This is also the situation of women in many civilizations. They can only submit to the laws, the gods, the customs, and the truths created by the males. Even today in Western countries, among women who have not had in their work an apprenticeship of freedom, there are still many who take shelter in the shadow of men. They adopt without discussion the opinions and values recognized by their husband or their lover, and that allows them to develop childish qualities which are forbidden to adults because they are based on a feeling of irresponsibility. So these situations differ from that of a child in certain respects. The child situation is imposed on him, remember, whereas the woman chooses it, or at least consents to it. Let's read further on page 38. The Negro slave of the 18th century, the Muslim woman enclosed in a harem, have no instrument, be it in thought or by astonishment or anger, 
which permits them to attack the civilization which oppresses them. Their behavior is defined and can be judged only within this given situation. And it is possible that in this situation, limited like every human situation, they realize a perfect assertion of their freedom. But once there appears a possibility of liberation, it is resignation of freedom not to exploit the possibility. A resignation which implies dishonesty and which is a positive fault. So de Beauvoir doesn't exactly blame the oppressed completely for not fully realizing the extent of the oppression, but once they realize it, it seems to me that she's saying they have no excuse. This would be dishonest, and they should take any chance they get to liberate themselves. It is rare, however, she thinks, to maintain this infantile state beyond our adolescence. Most of us grow beyond this state, unless we're forced into it like these oppressed classes that she alludes to. Because once we hit adolescence, we start to see flaws in this state of thinking, this perspective. We start to revolt. And in astonishment, we ask ourselves, why am I supposed to act this way? What would happen if I acted a different way? What good is it to do this? Once adolescence comes, we start to waver. We start to vacillate. We discover what de Beauvoir calls our subjectivity and the subjectivity of others. We start to notice contradictions among the adults, as well as their hesitations, as well as their weaknesses. Men no longer appear as gods. Adults are fallible. At the same time, we start to discover the human character of the reality around us. All this language, these customs, the ethics and values, all the things that we understand have their source in these uncertain creatures, these adults that we used to think of as gods. We discover that we are called on to participate, to choose, and to decide. And that's what makes adolescence so difficult for de Beauvoir. She says, this is when the individual must at last assume his subjectivity. This is the collapsing of the serious world, that serious world that we took as a given. And the collapsing of this world is a deliverance. We are liberated. Although we're irresponsible, the child is defenseless against this serious world, against these obscure powers of the parents. Remember, it's always because I said so. That's always the answer we can get. And we don't really have any way to argue against that. But with this liberation comes confusion. The adolescent is abandoned, unjustified. What will we do in the face of this new situation? And doubtless, once we decide, once we decide where our values lie, we can always reconsider this, but conversions of this, of this magnitude are, are usually difficult. But of course, because moral choice is free, it is also unforeseeable. Remember what Sartre says about despair. De Beauvoir makes the point that the child does not contain in him the man he will become. And yet it is always on the basis of what he has been that the, that the, the child decides on what he wants to be. But we always have a possible recourse to ourselves. No choice is so unfortunate that we cannot be saved. At least the choice of a project. Perhaps particular choices are ones that, you know, if I decide to do one thing or another, sometimes I can't go back on that. I can't go back. Let's talk, like Sophie's choice, right? She has to decide which one of her children gets executed, right? She's a prisoner of war uh, of the Nazis. Uh, that's a choice she can't go back on. But, you know, those choices, of course, we can't go back on. But as far as our choice about what we value and what means something to us, for the existentialists like Sartre and de Beauvoir, this is something we can always reconsider. We can always change our mind about this. But once we decide about this, we have to uphold this if it means anything to us. Uh, as she puts it, this moment of justification extends throughout our whole adult life. This places our attitude on a moral plane. We cast ourselves into the world by making ourselves a lack of being. What does she mean by this? She says this a lot, that we make ourselves a lack of being. How do we make ourselves a lack of being? Well, it's like Sartre when he talks about our project. When I set up a goal or a project, I want to be a 
successful student, or I want to be a professor, or I want to get a master's degree, I want to become a police officer, whatever it is that project is, by setting that goal, I essentially make myself a lack of being. I lack being that thing that I want to become. I lack being the police officer. I lack being the person with the doctorate. I lack being the, the student. And then I try to become that. And by, by being this lack of being, by, be, by making myself a lack of being, I contribute to human signification. I disclose beings. By becoming this lack of being, by lacking, you know, by, by not being a police officer and wanting to become one, things will be significant to me. I will look into the newspaper and I will do research about, you know, who's hiring law enforcement officers and what way I, what do I, how do I go about becoming one? The world takes on a certain character based upon this lack of being which I've become. So in a sense, by making myself a lack of being, I disclose a world of beings that are significant to me. Like Sartre, she believes that we are radically free, and she says that it's doubtless that we cast ourselves into the world on the basis of physical or physiological possibilities, but she counters that the body itself is not some brute fact. It does express a certain relation that we have to the world. This is why it's an object of sympathy. But on the other hand, she doesn't think it determines any behavior. So just like Sartre, a constitution is not an act. Those who restrain themselves from making themselves a lack of being, in the sense that she means we make ourselves a lack of being, those who restrain themselves from doing this, they make themselves blind and deaf, in a sense, she says. They have no love or desire, really. This is an apathetic attitude. It's a manifestation of what she calls a fundamental fear of existence. Those who so restrain themselves would be considered what she calls a sub-man. The sub-man rejects passion, which is the human condition. She compares the sub-man to a bad painter who's immediately satisfied with his bad paintings, whereas the artistic genius immediately recognizes a demand for a higher work of art. The original poverty of the sub-man's project exempts him from really ever seeking to legitimize it. Around him is this dull and insignificant world. I mean, sure, his behavior might indicate certain goals, and circumscribe certain values. But his whole behavior tends towards an elimination of those ends that he set himself up for, towards those uh, goals that he set up for himself. His acts are never positive choices, says de Beauvoir, just flights from choice. He can't help being a presence, of course, he exists, but he tries to maintain this on the plane of bare facticity. Of course, we cannot merge with trees and pebbles. We can't be an inkwell the way an inkwell is an inkwell, as Sartre says. We will never be an in itself. And the subman will arouse contempt, she says, because one recognizes him to be responsible for himself, just as he is not willing himself. He's ignoring his freedom, according to the existentialist. No man is a datum. No man is just suffered. This rejection of existence is just another way of existing. We can't opt out of existence. The defeat of the subman is that no man is a tomb, at least while he is alive. His negativity is revealed positively as anguish, desire, appeal, etc. He thereby is led to embrace or take refuge in the ready-made values of the serious world. Let's read here on page 44. He is afraid of engaging himself in a project as he is afraid of being disengaged and thereby of being in a state of danger before the future, in the midst of possibilities. He is thereby led to take refuge in the ready-made values of the serious world. He will proclaim certain opinions. He will take shelter behind a label. And to hide his indifference, he will readily abandon himself to verbal outburst or even physical violence. One day a monarchist, the next day an anarchist. He is more readily anti-Semitic, anti-clerical, or anti-Republican. 
Thus, though we have defined him as a denial and a flight, the subman is not a harmless creature. He realizes himself in the world as a blind, uncontrolled force, which anybody can get control of. In lynchings, in pogroms, in all the great bloody movements organized by the fanaticism of seriousness and passion, movements where there is no risk, those who do the actual dirty work are recruited from among the sub-men. So the sub-men are the blind followers of despotic rulers, these people with the pitchforks and the torches. They do the dirty work. They embrace what Nietzsche calls the herd instinct. All who will freedom, all who assert freedom, are disgusted by the sub-man, according to de Beauvoir. Instead of triumphing over their facticity, the sub-man focuses on and embraces facticity. What the sub-man fears is the shock of the unforeseen. It reminds him of the agony of his freedom. So in order to get rid of his freedom, he has to engage it properly. This is when the sub-man's attitude logically passes over into the attitude of the serious man. The serious man forces himself to submerge his freedom into the content which is acceptable by society. He loses himself in the object in order to annihilate subjectivity. And this is a sort of deceitful stupidity. It gets rid of man's freedom, according to de Beauvoir, by claiming to subordinate this freedom to these would-be unconditioned values. The serious man imagines that by adhering to these values, this permanently makes or confers value on him. He shields himself with rights, and he escapes the stress of existence. The serious man is not defined in terms of the end which he pursues. This is not what's important. It's being able to lose himself in that end. There is a serious, a serious man from the moment that freedom denies itself. Of all the disingenuous attitudes or the inauthentic attitudes that de Beauvoir speaks of, she thinks the serious man is the most widespread. One does not so readily accept becoming a human with all this anxiety and doubt, a free individual with all the anxiety and doubt that attends to that. On page 47, she writes, That what is to be done, she asks, what is to be believed? Often the young man who is not like the sub-man first rejected existence, so these questions are not even raised, is nevertheless frightened at having to answer them. After a more or less long crisis, either he turns back toward the world of his parents and teachers, or he adheres to the values which are new, but seem to him just as sure. Instead of assuming an affectivity which would throw him dangerously beyond himself, he represses it. Skipping forward there, the thing that matters to the serious man is not so much the nature of the object which he prefers to himself, but rather the fact of being able to lose himself in it, so much so that the movement toward the object is, in fact, through his arbitrary act, the most radical assertion of subjectivity. To believe for belief's sake, to will for will's sake, detaching transcendence from its end, to realize one's freedom in an empty and absurd form of a freedom of indifference. So this is a freedom of indifference, and really no better than the sub-man. The serious man ceaselessly renews a denial of freedom. It's almost like if you remember maybe back in your days of high school when people were sort of in these cliques. I remember the high school I went to, all the jocks and the preps hung out together, and all of the skaters and the punk rockers, and even the hippies and the goth kids would all hang out together. And, uh, you know, we had a big agriculture department, so there's all these cowboys and kickers. They'd all hang out together. And once you decided what clique you were in, once you decided what form of the serious that you would take, you didn't really think much about anything else as far as what kind of clothes you wore. You just did what they did. When you go to the, gro when you go to the, the store to buy some clothes, you know, if you're, the, uh, if you're the, the prep, you don't think, well, what do I like? What's going to look good on me? You think, well, what's in style? What's in fashion? Similarly, if you're a punk rocker, right, what's, what's the cool band? You know, how do I rebel? How, how do I do this? And, and you try to fit into that mold. This is what the serious man does. Ceaselessly renews this denial of freedom, almost this systematic denial of freedom. She calls him the mythomaniac who forgets 
that she's written a love letter to herself. So she writes a love letter to herself and puts it away, forgets about it, and then reads it. Oh, I'm so awesome, aren't I? Somebody loves me. So some people, again, are denied instruments of escape. They're, they're enslaved. They're mystified. And, and, and Sartre, I think he doesn't really get to this point, and this is where I think she's more subtle than him. De Beauvoir, she admits that the less economic and social circumstances allow the individual to act upon the world, the more that the world appears as given. You know, right? We can understand that women in certain societies, minorities of the oppressed, they can't help but see the serious world as something that's given. But she says the serious man, by denying freedom, makes himself a slave to the end he has set up or that he's borrowed from convention. He forgets that every goal is at the same time a point of departure and that human freedom is ultimate. It is the individual who accords an absolute meaning to the term useful. This is a critique that she uses in a later chapter that we'll cover in the next lecture. That useful has no meaning in and of itself. It's like words like right or left, up or down. If you ask me, how do I get to Austin? And I told you, well, you take a left and, and then you drive a while and then take a right and, and then another left. And then you take another right and go for a while. And then you take a left and then you'll be there. Uh, you won't be able to get to Austin, will you? Left, right, up, down, these need a complement. And so does the term useful. Useful designates a relation. It requires a complement. Useful for what? Useful for this. Useful for that. And the serious man puts nothing into question. He thinks his useful is just objectively useful. And this is what makes the serious man dangerous, according to de Beauvoir. On page 49, she writes, The serious man puts nothing into question. For the military man, the army is useful. For the colonial administrator, the highway. For the serious revolutionary, the revolution. Army, highway, revolution, productions becoming inhuman idols to which one will not hesitate to sacrifice man himself. Therefore, the serious man is dangerous. It is natural that he makes himself a tyrant. Dishonestly ignoring the subjectivity of his choice, he pretends that the unconditioned value of the object is being asserted through him. And by the same token, he also ignores the value of the subjectivity and the freedom of others, to such an extent that, sacrificing them to the thing, he persuades himself that what he sacrifices is nothing. There's actually a great short story by Franz Kafka called In the Penal Colony that really demonstrates this point, where the executioner there in the penal colony is so impressed by the execution device, this, this torture device that tortures or often kills the, the, the inmates, that he fails to see the humanity behind it, right? And how grotesque and inhumane the process itself is. He lets the serious turn to a sort of fanaticism and is willing to sacrifice anybody in favor of the thing, in favor of the object. So sacrificing oneself to the thing, this is the danger of the serious. Sacrificing the individual to the object, Right, economists, social engineers, communists, I suppose, with their revolutions, politicians with their platforms. The serious, she says, in all cases, can lead to a blind fanaticism. In order to justify the contradictory, the absurd, and outrageous aspects of this behavior, the serious man will often take refuge in disputing the serious of others, not his own serious, of course. But as soon as his idol, this concept or this idea, this thing, this object, as soon as this is not concerned, the serious often slips into the attitude of the subman. And thus, when experts step outside of their field of expertise, says de Beauvoir, they're often lacking in sensitivity, intelligence, and humanity. Having abdicated freedom, the serious man has nothing left but his techniques. And wherever those techniques are not applicable, he either adheres to the most ordinary values or he simply takes flight. And a serious man's life will lose all meaning if he finds himself cut off from his ends. If I tell myself that the military life is the only life that's worth living and I'm cut off from that, if I have a physical condition or a, or a disease or an illness that I can't serve in the military, what will happen, right, if I'm completely cut off from my ends? 
what happens is I might turn to nihilism. So the serious man escapes the anguish of freedom only to fall into a state of preoccupation, a state of worry, because everything is a threat to him. Because his idol is an externality, something external to him, it's perpetually threatened, perpetually capable of being shattered by the universe around it. And despite precautions, he'll never master this exterior world. He'll be constantly upset by the uncontrollable course of events. On page 52, she writes, He will always be saying that he's disappointed, for his wish to have the world harden into a thing is belied by the very movement of life. The future will contest his present successes. His children will disobey him. His will will be opposed by those of strangers. He will be a prey to ill humor and bitterness. His very successes have a taste of ashes. For the serious is one of those ways of trying to realize the impossible synthesis of the in itself and the for itself. The serious man wills himself to be a god, but he is not one and knows it. He wishes to rid himself of his subjectivity but it constantly risks being unmasked. It is unmasked. Transcending all goals, reflection wonders. What's the use? There then blazes forth the absurdity of a life which has sought outside of itself the justification which it alone could give itself. Detached from the freedom which might have genuinely grounded them, all the ends that have been pursued appear arbitrary and useless. So the failure of the serious brings about a radical disorder. Conscious of his inability to be anything, the serious man often becomes nihilistic. He wants to be nothing, this stationary datum. Nihilism is disappointed seriousness turned back upon itself. The universe exists and it continues in order for the nihilist to detest it, to scoff at it. It's still very close to the serious. He wants to believe in the serious world, the nihilist does. He, he confirms it by his revolt. He feels himself as a negation, as a freedom, but he doesn't realize this freedom as a positive liberation. He only feels it as a lack, not one that is a positive lack, but simply a negative lack. And he can push this scorn farther and farther until he seeks the annihilation of the world he rejects. But in that sense, he would resign himself to a project that's doomed to fail. He devotes himself to a project that he's bent on ruining. Of course, he hates the world, but he almost wants it to be there in order for him to hate it, to reject everyone else's projects one after another systematically. But this negation constantly belies itself. We can't opt out of existence. It discloses, it manifests as it negates. This implies a constant tension, and the attitude of the nihilist can perpetuate itself as such only if it reveals a positivity at its very core. The nihilistic attitude does manifest a certain truth, she claims, because in this attitude, our experiences of the ambiguity of the human condition are real. But the mistake is that it sees man not as a positive existence of a lack, but as a lack at the heart of existence. In this case, freedom is experienced as a rejection. It's not genuinely a fulfillment of freedom. The nihilist is right in thinking that the world possesses no justification and he himself is nothing, but he forgets that it's up to him to justify the world and make himself exist validly. So the nihilist rejects existence without managing to eliminate it. He denies this transcendence that he is. Why does she keep using this word transcendence? How do we transcend? Well, by our projects we transcend, our bare facticity. That's why it's ambiguous. That's why this is the ethics of ambiguity. What is ambiguity? What is ambiguous? Well, when something's ambiguous, it's hard to discern what it means. Something has a meaning that could be interpreted in different ways. It's ambiguous. Well, she thinks our existence is ambiguous. In what way? Well, in one sense, we're absolutely free, but in another, we're completely determined. We didn't choose to be. We didn't choose to exist. As Sartre says, we're condemned to be free. But once we're here, we're absolutely free and we transcend our facticity. How do we do this? Through our projects. Because remember, when I set up a project, when I set up a goal, that confers meaning on my world. 
The world, according to the existentialist, doesn't have a prefabricated meaning, one that's there waiting for me. I justify it. I give it meaning through my projects. So in a sense, I transcend all of these things. Even though that project is not there in my existence, it's not there in my world, it's not a hard in fact, it confers meaning on my world. So I'm a transcendence in this respect. And so the nihilist rejects this. He, he denies his transcendence. And so both the person who delights in freedom and the nihilist are opposed to the serious because they understand that they are a transcendence. But in another sense, the nihilist is an enemy because the nihilist systematically rejects the world and humankind. It establishes a tyranny which de Beauvoir thinks that freedom must stand up against. The nihilist overlooks this absolute end of freedom, that if I want freedom for myself, I have to appeal to the freedom of the other, and I want them to be free as well. Now, the next type or character type or disingenuous attitude that de Beauvoir speaks of is the adventurer. The adventurer is the man who discerns that freedom is the universal absolute end. Even in failure, he takes delight in living. It almost sounds like this Nietzschean Superman or Uberman who can affirm existence. He's not going to turn aside. The adventurer will not turn aside from things which he doesn't believe in, like the serious man might. He throws himself into his undertakings with zest into exploration, conquest, war, speculation, love, politics. But he doesn't attach himself to the end at which he aims, only to the conquest itself, only to the adventure. He likes action for action's sake. Now, where does the taste for adventure develop? Throughout the chapter, de Beauvoir describes how these different attitudes move into each other, right? How one develops to the other. The nihilist is typically the serious man who has failed, right? who has had all that serious uh, world cut off, you know, been cut off from his ends. Where does this adventurer develop from? Well, she says either nihilistic despair, maybe the nihilist kind of lightens up and decides to go ahead and seize the day. Or maybe this is born directly from the happy days of childhood or something like this, or just a vivacious spirit but it always implies that freedom is realized as independence. Independence from perhaps the serious world. The ambiguity of our existence is not felt as a lack, but in its positive aspect. So to be an adventurer, one requires an abundant vitality and a reflective skepticism. Why a reflective skepticism? Again, remember, it sets up goals, but it's not so attached to those goals. So when they fail, they're not going to be that concerned because they're, they're reflectively skeptical. They never really were attached to it anyways. It could have been wrong. So what? It's all about the adventurer. So what's the problem here with the adventurer? For de Beauvoir, the adventurer's attitude is not always pure. They're attached to their career, to their success. The zest they have for existence is never experienced in its gratuity. What does she mean by that? It's gratuity. Again, it's this point that her and Sartre keep making that if I assert my own freedom, I have to assert the freedom of the other. I have to want freedom for everybody. That's what it is in its gratuity, freedom in its gratuity, existence in its gratuity. So the adventurer fails to feel this gratuity of existence. The love for adventure is often mixed with attachment to values of the serious. How does this work? Well, she says... Cortez was serving God and the emperor by serving his own pleasure. Cortez the conquistador. But what distinguishes the adventure from a simple game is that the adventurer doesn't limit himself to his own existence in a solitary fashion. He asserts it in a relationship to other existences. He has to declare himself. Every undertaking unfolds in a human world and affects men. And so the adventurer often remains indifferent to the content of his action, the human meaning of his action. He thinks he can assert his existence without taking into account others. So the adventurer shares the nihilist's contempt for men. By this contempt, nothing prevents him from sacrificing these insignificant beings to his own will for power. He'll treat them like instruments, destroy them if they get in the way. And he appears as an enemy, 
in the eyes of others. His undertaking is not only a wager, it is a combat. He makes himself a tyrant or a hangman. He can't impose his tyranny without help. So he's obliged to serve the regime which will allow him to exercise his tyranny. This is why he has to attach himself to one form of the serious or another. Thus, the adventurer ultimately falls into the servitude of the object with this pretext for independence. Let's read here on page 62. He will range himself on the side of the regimes which guarantee him his privileges, and he will prefer those who confirm him in his contempt regarding the common herd. He will make himself its accomplice, its servant, or even its valet, alienating a freedom which, in reality, cannot confirm itself as such if it does not wear its own face. In order to have wanted to limit it to itself, in order to have emptied it of all concrete content, he realizes it only as an abstract independence which turns into servitude. He must submit to masters unless he makes himself the supreme master. Favorable circumstances are enough to transform the adventurer into a dictator. He carries the seed of one within him. Since he regards mankind as indifferent matter, destined to support the game of his existence. But what he then knows is the supreme servitude of tyranny. So even if he becomes the dictator, he still has to be able to keep that power. And how does he do this? Well, he's got to have his henchmen. He's got to have his army. He's not completely free. He has to appeal to the other. The adventurer encloses himself in a false independence which will indeed be servitude. And to the free man, he will be only a chance ally. And you can't really have complete confidence in him. He could easily become an enemy. Now we move on to the final disingenuous attitude that de Beauvoir covers here. It's called the passionate man. And in a way, the passionate man is the antithesis of the adventurer. The passionate man sets up the object as an absolute not as a thing detached from himself, like the serious man does, but as a thing disclosed only by his subjectivity. And this can happen when we we have a goal which was first willed in the name of the serious. It can become an object of passion. Inversely, a passionate object or attachment can wither away into just a serious relationship. Particularly an amorous passion, if you're in a romantic relationship, You don't want the beloved to be admired objectively, per se. You almost prefer to think of her as unknown, unrecognized, if you're the passionate man. The lover thinks that his appropriation is greater if he alone is revealing of her worth. So, in this case, freedom doesn't exist in its genuine form. Nothing exists outside of this stubborn project. Nothing can induce the passionate man to modify his choices. He makes himself a lack of being, not that there might be being, things out there that are significant, but in order to be, to become this thing, he remains at a distance and is never fulfilled, right? Freedom in this case is only realized as a separation. Only the object of his passion appears real or full to him. All the rest are insignificant. And any means that are used to get the object of passion are justified. Page 66. Why not betray, kill, grow violent? It is never nothing that one destroys. The whole universe is perceived only as an ensemble of means or obstacles through which it's a matter of attaining the thing in which one has engaged his being. Not intending his freedom for men, the passionate man does not recognize them as freedoms either. He will not hesitate to treat them as things. If the object of his passion concerns the world in general, then this tyranny becomes fanaticism. So there is no serious fanaticism, she she claims, which doesn't have a sort of passional basis. Yet, there's a glimmer of hope for the passionate man. She thinks that a conversion towards this more existentialist viewpoint that, that asserts freedom can start within passion itself. And the cause of the torment for the passionate man is his distance from the object but he must accept this distance instead of trying to eliminate it. She claims that it is only as something strange, forbidden, only as something free, that the other is revealed as an other. And to love is to love the otherness, to love that freedom by which it escapes. Love is not possession. 
It is the renunciation of all possession, of all confusion. And this sort of generosity, this renunciation of possession, cannot be exercised to just any object whatsoever, a chair, a table, something like this. It can only be, this generosity can only be expressed towards another freedom, says de Beauvoir on page 67. Such generosity cannot be exercised on behalf of any object whatsoever. One cannot love a pure thing in its independence and its separation, for the thing does not have a positive independence. If a man prefers the land he has discovered to the possession of this land, a painting or a statue to their material presence, it is insofar as they appear to him as possibilities open to other men. Passion is converted to genuine freedom only if one destines his existence to other existences through the being, whether thing or man, at which he aims, without hoping to entrap it in the destiny of the in itself. So we don't want to completely seal the deal. We don't want things to congeal and harden into things. We have to keep the game rolling, the game of existence. And so I think the assertion that de Beauvoir is clearly making throughout this chapter is that no existence can be validly fulfilled if it is limited to itself. I think this is de Beauvoir's main thesis in chapter two. We always have to appeal to the existence of others in order to validly fulfill our own existence. Any of these attitudes, these disingenuous attitudes, these inauthentic attitudes towards existence, the sub-man, the serious man, the nihilist, the passionate man, the adventurer, they all have to appeal to the other, yet they try to deny this. They try to deny some aspect of their freedom. She writes on page 70 that freedom must project itself toward its own reality through a content whose value it establishes. So freedom is not to be engulfed in any one goal, nor is it to dissipate vainly without aiming at any goal whatsoever. No quietism here. The bond we have with others, though, this, this, this bond we have with other people's freedom, she admits that it doesn't immediately reveal itself to everyone. Our first, our first reaction is to hate them, to see them as a threat. But she sees this hatred as naive, and the desire to hate them immediately struggles against itself. On page 71, she writes, If I were really everything, there would be nothing beside me. The world would be empty. There would be nothing to possess, and I myself would be nothing. If he's reasonable, the young man immediately understands that by taking the world away from me, others also give it to me, since the thing is given to me only by the movement which snatches it from me. To will that there be being is also to will that there be men by and for whom the world is endowed with human significations. One can reveal the world only on a basis revealed by other men. No project can be defined except by its interference with other projects. To make being be is to communicate with others by means of being, existing, and valuing things. So no project can be defined except by its interference with other projects. Freedom cannot will itself without aiming at a, an open future. Remember Sartre's despair. So every man needs the freedom of other men in the sense he wants it. He may fail to assume honestly the consequences of such a wish, but only the freedom of others keeps each of us from hardening into absurdity, hardening into facticity. So existentialism is not solipsism. It doesn't say that we only know ourselves, because knowing ourselves includes an appeal to the other. The me-others relationship, as de Beauvoir puts it, the me-others relationship is indissoluble as the subject-object relation. And the other charge, that existentialism is a formal doctrine that's incapable of proposing any real concrete content, she says that to will oneself is also to will other people free. This is not just an abstract formula. It points to each person. It points to each concrete action to be achieved. And there are these concrete and difficult problems that arise in our relations with others. She admits this. And she'll turn to this, this positive aspect of our morality in chapter three. So, so far she's been talking in ne negative terms, how not to approach existence, how not to be concerned with our freedom. Now, what are we supposed to positively do? We'll have to cover this in our next lecture.